Thank you. So thank you on behalf of Dinesh. Dinesh couldn't be with us. He's, he was ill and couldn't um, come to Argentina. But he's asked me to show his slides, which would probably take me a long way over his 10 minute um, allowable time. And so for that reason, I've taken some uh, paragraphs from his slides, which I think illustrate the main points that he wants to make. And I'll just be reading those out to you. He sends his greetings to his friends here, by the way, and sorry, sorry he couldn't be here. Um, what Dinesh does in his paper, uh, or in his presentation, is draw on this idea of um, politics and changing the politics of innovation. But he focuses on India, and he focuses on historical episodes in science and technology policy making in the subcontinent to offer lessons and ways forward for current debates, both in, both in India and also internationally. So, Dinesh's first point is that the freedom movement, which led to the independence um, of India, ensured people's participation, broad participation, in agenda setting, funding, organizing, capacity building, and monitoring with respect to the creation of new social carriers of innovation. The freedom movement was a key influence with respect to the determination of innovation directions and institutions proposed ultimately for learning and competence building for social inclusion. People's participation in agenda setting was ensured. Their creativity was unleashed and all the political tendencies were compelled to negotiate and engage as the, the, the new state emerged. So the Gandhians, the Nehruvians, the left, all worked together in the early stages of um, Indian history, according to Dinesh's analysis. And as an example, Dinesh highlights the first commission on higher education where agenda setting took place, the 1949 Radhakrishna Commission. This began by highlighting that, as reported in the 1941 census, about 85% of the population of India lived in villages. And so that was the population that was to be served. The process involved the Nehruvians, Gandhians, and leftists to state in one voice the formation of rural and urban universities, which to, were to follow different ways of funding, capacity building, organizing, and accountability in innovation. The Radhakrishna Commission defined the university designs in terms of not only how to integrate the missions of teaching, of research, and extension, therefore an integrated form of scholarship, but it also demanded that they create the resources needed for learning, competence building, and innovation, making for the cultivation of diversity, direction, and distribution in the indigenous models of agriculture and in other sectors. So Gandhi's concept of nai talim, sometimes translated as basic education, was also put forward at this, side, this time and conceived as a new unique mode of learning, but suffered from a number of difficulties especially with the master-apprentice mode, which it advocated. In the end, then, a different model, uh, which didn't draw from the Radhakrishna Commission, but from a model, the model of Pantnagar University, which was created through U.S. Indo-U.S. Indo collaboration, was used and actually served as a model for a lot of the higher education in the country. This came alongside a closure of the previously open earlier debates during the post-60s, marginalizing the upgrading efforts of traditional systems. Import replacement became the model, and the power of big business and the landed gentry came into play, with a focus on large-scale industries, atomic energy, chemical complexes to feed, industrializing agriculture. And closure of these debates also occurred because the nation state did not wish to carry out land reforms and focused instead on a technology assessment, technology system associated with the Green Revolution, which the state subsidized heavily to achieve higher agricultural productivity and production served to stabilize the role of rural gentry and big business. The Radha Krishna Commission plans were therefore abandoned in the Indo-US Indo cooperation in respect of agriculture and small-scale industry determined the course of development. The stage was set for a period of passive imitation of the innovation directions in, seen previously in the developed world. 
Technology system designs for the resource-based industries got completely linked to the use of chemicals and energy-intensive materials in agriculture and industry. New capital goods industries were taken up with the support of the Soviet Union and Europe in an imitative way. These industries could not provide the engine of nationwide industrialization as they did not relate to the life in the villages. So the lesson, therefore, is the, that the systemic nature of supply and demand side interactions was uh, neglected but needs to be grasped when we're launching new efforts in the area of social inclusion. The task that India faced was upgrading the peasant artisan economy as a system which could withstand competition from big business and others who were using and benefiting from economies of scale and scope. The Khadi and Village in Industries Commission was set up in the image of Gandhians and the CSIR was set up in the image of Nehruvians, following the Nehruvian tradition. Both attempted to do this, to make individual producers competitive. But ultimately, neither worked to the advantage of rural and urban poor. And thanks to liberalization, subsequent to this period of closing down, experimental spaces further declined during the 80s and the 90s. However, some survived. In the second half of the 80s, the people's science movements tried using the systemic approach, for example, through national missions in the sectors of leather or agro-processing. Their results have been better, and in some cases, some of these technology systems are now supported by the Department of Science and Technology. However, Dinesh, in his presentation, also stresses that the other major weakness at this stage, now impacting on progress, is the loss of the counter-hegemonic status of these ideas. No longer is this a struggle, um, part of a wider independent struggle or a wider freedom struggle, but um, just a number of experiments happening across the country. He refers to this as the problem of the, a weak subjective factor. So in conclusion, what is to be done, and I'm basically reading what Dinesh wrote here, Experimental spaces are possible to be created even now, and the examples of open source and open access are there before us to see. We need appropriate social carriers of innovation. We need to explore the possibilities of building on the earlier experiments through a freedom movement-like effort with lessons learned about how to provide ecologically and socially just solutions in a sustainable way. Through the change in the political practice of innovation, the subjective factor must be strengthened. So theory, policy, and practice must dance together, in his words. New types of bridging organizations are required. And viable network formation requires centering on the development of appropriate practices in food, health, IT, and energy technologies. Following agroecological approaches is key in agriculture and breaking the ecological and social connections of pre-capitalist formations with the processes of capitalist development. We need to mobilize the petty producers in a way that will allow them to see their interests with the workers and establish worker-peasant unity in production. Finally, internationally, international trading and investment arrangements are trying to foster agribusiness, global pharma business, and corporate biotech. We can resist only through the implementation of alternate political theory, policy, and practice, and creating international solidarity around sector-based efforts whilst strengthening um, umbrella efforts is the way forward. So thanks to Dinesh.